And now, the survival show that once survived hiding strange things in small places. In this episode, we sit down with Alana Barfield. We're going to discuss storage options for apartment dwellers and share a cool James Bond-like DIY project with you. Howdy, and welcome to the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 198. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. A quick note and message before we get into this episode. Josh, we're thinking of you, man. Hope you feel better soon. And well, now let's give you something to pass the time with. Alana, welcome back to In the Rabbit Hole. Hi, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. Hey, lady, you know, it's rare that we get you on episodes back to back like this. I mean, they're not back to back, but they're pretty close together because you're usually yeah, well, gallivanting around and it's it's uh, <laughs> We yeah, feel really privileged. <laughs> <laughs> we feel very privileged to have you back. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about uh, prepping in smaller spaces. So apartments, RVs, tiny houses, things like that. So I, this is awesome. And this plays into a lot of what you're doing with your time, time these days. And we've got some cool stories also at the end about some people that you're helping out. And I think there's some big takeaways there for people about their parents and helping their parents prep, especially uh, their moms if they're widowers. But we'll get all to that in a bit. So let's start off with kind of the basics. And I'll lay this out. I, I don't have it's been a very long time since I've lived in an apartment. And while I have some space constraints, just because I live in a very open floor plan home now, it's it's kind of difficult to tuck away things we don't necessarily want to to telegraph to people. But I guess let's start with what are the priorities when you're dealing with an apartment? Because it's diff, it is, there's a lot of differences from prepping in an apartment versus prepping in a house. But let's start with the priorities. Where, where do we start with that? What do we focus on? Well, you definitely want to focus on the more imminent dangers, more imminent disasters, maybe not prepping for, you know, the, the EMPs and the zombies, but for the, the flooding, the tornado, the earthquakes, whatever, or um, something that may be happening just in that area. Like generally apartments are going to be found in more urban areas. So you have to consider um, kind of what's around that complex, what could go wrong, different, um, what's the word, like complexes and things, as I've, I've seen so many times on the news, a, a plant or a business or something catching on fire and they have to evacuate the apartments that are across the street from it and things like that. You mm-hmm. have to kind of consider that that whole radius sometimes. Yeah, I know there was a big fire at a, an apartment complex not too far from my house recently. And I mean, it whipped through that apartment complex pretty fast. I felt pretty bad for the people. And, yeah, and that is, yeah, and that's fun. a lot more likely than dealing with the zombie apocalypse, of course. Uh, although fun, uh, probably yeah. more practical to focus on fire and natural disasters and things like that. But when we get into storage of things, what are we looking at as far as priorities of what we need to, or what apartment and people in combined spaces need to focus on uh, really what their storage needs are? Well, you're going to have basically the same priorities as far as food, water, hygiene, first aid, um, cash, and your informational um, items stored. But you are going to have to be a little more selective in what you actually store just because you don't have the luxury of space. So like food, for example, you want to focus more on um, storing high calorie food. Versus the low calorie stuff. So maybe more peanut butter, mm-hmm. um, energy bars, things like that versus a bunch of oatmeal and, and rice, mm-hmm. which it's great to have some of that on hand still, but you're going to have to kind of weigh that balance a little bit more and just try to pack more calories and energy into that smaller package. Okay. So what about when it comes to water, I guess, does it end up being more about using filters or inflatable containers rather than keeping water around all the time? 
Yeah, it's a little of both of that. Unfortunately, you can't miniaturize water or dehydrate water for easier storage. <laughs> it, that would it's be so impressive. It's so huge and heavy. There's not a lot of ways around that. You still want to have at least a few days of ready-to-drink water somewhere. Um, and in this case, you want to probably have larger containers of it versus like a, a case of small bottled water. You might have a you know, a, one of those water cubes, they hold three or three and a half gallons mm-hmm. or, you know, a four to five gallon carboy, a couple of those tucked away in the back of your closet versus a case of, you know, 12 ounce water bottles. Cause you just get more out of it. But yeah. Um, storage and filtering does come into play. Like that's going to be essential because whatever you can manage to store in your apartment is probably going to go away a lot faster than somebody who has, you know, stacks and stacks of it in their garage. Mm -hmm. So you're going to want to look at those, um, like the bathtub water storage bags, those Bob bags. Mm -hmm. That's something good to have on hand because if you do have a little bit of warning and you have to store water, you have time to fill that up. So you're going to have to look at um, those sort of options more than just straight up water storage. I gotcha. So what about when it comes to storage of tools and items such as blackout kits and things like that? How does how does being in an apartment affect that? That gets a little more tricky because gear and kits and things like that can easily just overtake your space. (laughs) And yes, (laughs) you'll have to like get rid of your couch because you're going to sit on a backpack (laughs) instead now. And also you don't want people to walk in and immediately think, oh, look at all this stuff you have. Mm-hmm. Want to kind of keep it hidden from prying eyes. So for storage of things like that, you have to get a little creative and really look for that unused space. Like, we're, you know, it, there's under the bed storage, things like that, back of the closet. Um, you might even have to kind of change your, your design style a little bit and incorporate pieces of furniture. Like, I love wardrobes and armoires for things like that Mm. because you can close them up they look pretty they just look like an entertainment center or a little office center but there's tons of storage in there instead of using the closet side you can hang up um, backpacks and stack bins in them and you have shelving to store all your other fun gear Mm. so something a piece like that is is really good to have and of course, there's no modifications to the actual apartment. You're not drilling in shelves or anything like that, which may cause you to lose your deposit or anything like that. Mm-hmm. So does that become an issue where I guess a lot of people can't put in shelving? I mean, even if it's something that maybe they would patch up their own holes before they left, does that does that become an issue for for apartment? You know, it just kind of depends on your landlord and on your lease. Um, mm. Most of them that I've seen are fine with you know, putting a couple of nails in the wall if it's not causing damage. Like you, you can, you know, hang a few nails and if it's something you can spackle up before you leave, it's, it's no big deal. But um, if you cut a section of wall out between some, some framing, that's another issue. (laughs) Yeah. Generally, if, if, you know, a shelf here or there, something is not going to break your lease, but of course you, you definitely want to check with your contract, but Mm-hmm. Yeah, shelves, just just a couple extra shelves placed somewhere is such a great thing to have. And you're looking at unused space. You want to look at maybe spaces above doors where you can, you know, put a little shelf, put a couple of decorative baskets up there, say, look innocuous and fill them with whatever you want. Mm. Like like pretty floofy, floofy little uh, baskets, but they're actually full of bullets or something cool. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you know, and putting a safe you know, for, you know, guns and ammo is, is ideal. But then again, those can be pretty cost prohibitive. Um, they can be heavy there. Maybe there are restrictions of, of weight if you're on an upper floor. Um, again, it's something you kind of want to check before you do something like that. But um, yeah, there are ways to at least hide from prying eyes on the surface with, um, you know, baskets and that sort of typical looking everyday stuff. Mm-hmm. Are there common areas that you find where, I mean, space gets wasted? I mean, it, we, we can just start with closets themselves. Is there like just air gaps and areas where it's just just wasted space that most people don't even think about using? 
Oh yeah, tons. Like the the closet is probably the best place to keep your more high value stuff just because it's less visible and you usually have to kind of walk through the place to get to it. But when you walk into a closet, of course, you've generally there's a couple of racks, maybe a shelf unit. Um, if there are no shelves above the the poles where you hang hangers, that's a great place to add a couple of easy shelves. And then you've got a lot of upper storage like that. And another place is when you walk into a closet, well, if you can walk into it, turn around all around that door frame generally is unused space. Like you can usually, you know, fit a couple of gun racks up above the door. Mm -hmm. um, and you have the space on each side of the door where you could, you know, stack some totes or put in a shelf. And I love um, kind of the, the innocuous, like blue plastic totes, like don't get the clear ones, get the ones you can't see through, mm -hmm. fill them up with whatever and just label on the outside, like baby clothes or sweaters or something. So if you do get that, that nosy party guest that just kind of likes to peek around, <laughs> they're going to see that like, Oh, that's no fun. Mm. <laughs> or you could booby trap things. That would be fun too. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> what, you know, you were talking about totes. What end up being the most, uh, versatile storage like options, I guess, for you? Or is it just a matter of kind of going down to Target and just looking around or something? Well, yeah, a lot of it's just going to be you know, what's in your budget, how much space do you have? Because even with apartments, you have, you know, the 500 square foot efficiencies with no walls. Then you have the multi-bedroom like penthouses and stuff. So you're going to want to really see what you have space for and just walk through your space and don't look at it as, you know, decorating, decorating or any sort of aesthetic. Just look at where there is space, where something could fit. And mm -hmm. a lot of times, like behind couches, you know, under beds and closets in the far back recesses of the cabinets in your kitchen where you would never really go anyway. There's a lot of space hidden a lot of times. Hmm. Before we head out of apartments, you said you've got a pretty cool list of tips that have proven to be helpful with in homes that could easily translate to apartments. And I guess starting at the front door and walking through, since that's probably the most systematic way to do this, what are these tips you got for us? Yeah, there's some really easy, simple and cheap, love that, um, ways to just look at your space and create space where there might not have been any before. It's all about just getting creative and using what you have. Um, let's just, well, I guess we can start the front door. Of course, security is any part of, of preparedness and prepping. You just want to not leave anything out the front door that could indicate what's inside. Like don't put like gun stickers all over your door and stuff like that. So just keep it very clean, very gray, very bland. And of course, secure Add some extra locks. I had a good friend, um, a couple of weeks ago, actually wake up to find somebody rummaging around in her apartment. Holy crap. <laughs> because they had figured out kind of the universal lock that all the apartments had and she didn't have a secondary one on the inside just for her. So that was a nice little morning surprise. So keep that in mind. Surprise. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and he didn't like her 38, so he took off pretty quickly. But yeah, it worked <laughs> out. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, usually you'll come into maybe like the kitchen. I did mention like the far deep back side of the cabinets you can just stack stuff up there because you're probably not going to go too far back in the cabinets anyhow so just use that negative space and those weird little cabinets that are above refrigerators a lot of times that you don't really get to very often because they're a pain great place to stash your like 72 hour kit or any emergency supplies because it's going to be kind of out of the way while we're in the kitchen grow some herbs and some medicinals and things like that. I and mean, if you're going to have house plants, anyhow, might as well throw in some rosemary or some ginger or something, aloe vera instead of just some useless like ficus tree. So <laughs> just kind of a little apartment homestead tip mm -hmm. <laughs> there for you. Now the living room has a lot of potential. It's usually the largest room and with a lot of unused space. One of my favorite little tricks that I like to do is put one of those big, like a big decorative vase or something by the door, you can put a lot of stuff in there and some very long things in there. If you, if you get my drift and just, you know, stick a wad of like dried flowers or something on the top of it, no one will ever be the wiser. And most people don't go around looking into something like that. Cause it's like an umbrella stand or whatever. So that's 
one of those little kind of hiding in plain sight sort of tricks that I love. Also, behind the couch. Um, if you have a couch up against a wall, that's a great place to maybe slip a really skinny little shelf. You know, put your candles and whatever on the top and the shelves underneath that are hidden up against the wall. Of course, use for anything else. If you want to go really big with it, pull the couch out away from the wall. I don't know, six inches, 10 inches, whatever you have room for. And put some pegs, Velcro, command hooks are great. I love those for just about everything. What are those? It's a plastic or summer metal. They're decorative. It's a hook that is adhesive and sticks to a wall and doesn't damage it. It has a removable adhesive pad on the back and they can actually hold a lot of weight. Huh. I have hung curtains like whole like heavy curtain rods with like velvet curtains and things on these adhesive hooks as a holder for the rod. And they, they look great. They don't scream, you know, temporary, but they're perfect for apartments too. Cause you can move them around and they don't put a hole in the wall, nothing to fix later. Cool. But they're very secure. They hold a lot of weight. So get creative with your configuration, whatever you might want to hang on the wall Stick a big curtain over that sucker and just let it hang behind the, the couch. You know, it's it creates a very dramatic and like romantic look for your living room. And you can pull the curtains back and there's your whatever. <laughs> and it only takes up a few inches of space just by pulling your couch out. And it's, again, one of those things that's really easy to get to, quickly accessible, but doesn't look out of the ordinary, doesn't look like anything. and doesn't really encroach on your space too much because it's all vertical. Mm. So instead of maybe hanging that big picture frame there, you could you know, put up some curtains or if your picture frame is deep enough, do the same concept, put stuff behind it, especially if it's like a stretched canvas type piece of art. You can even mm -hmm. deepen the frame by adding kind of a double frame to it, increasing the thickness. You do it the same way. OK, so I love that one. That works in the bedroom, too. Like behind the bed, you can do the same thing with kind of a curtain set up or a really large piece of art. Oh, your living room and your apartment may have a fireplace. Not too many of them down here in Texas, but some do. Don't forget the wood. Make sure your fireplace actually works. If something goes wrong and you actually have to use it for heat or maybe maybe cooking, don't neglect it. Um, you might actually have to use it. Stack up plenty of wood. Make it a focal point. <laughs> make it rustic. It's pretty. Whatever. <laughs> See, um, of course, there's all the storage furniture that we love. You've probably seen it on the internet where you open up the top of the coffee table and there's like guns all inside and mm -hmm. things like that. Those are great. You can get them custom made. Some are special order. You can kind of, if you're pretty handy with carpentry skills, you can probably easily DIY your own. So just incorporate storage like that into your everyday furniture. In your office, um, an extra file cabinet is really innocuous looking, really it just kind of blends in to everything. It doesn't look out of place. Um, have one for your paperwork, one for your gear. Get one that locks and um, keep snooping house guests out of it and everything fairly secure. Be kind of a, a poor man's safe, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you will. Also in the bedroom, platform beds are great or put lifts on your the feet of your regular bed mm -hmm. just to add more storage underneath. Throw a skirt on it and you have all that extra room. Of course, it's not necessarily more secure because the first place people are going to look for stuff is like under the bed, but it is just space to store stuff. And that's a great place for like all your water and things like that too. Oh, 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 one of my favorite things to do is to actually create a false wall. Ooh. It's very kind of like James Bond and it's way easier to do than it sounds like. Now in a house, of course you can hammer and nail and cut and saw to your heart's content, but in an apartment, to make it a little bit more temporary and with a lot less damage, you can use, let's say, kind of depending on the space, like the end of a hallway is good. Any kind of small, short wall underneath kind of like a bar counter area. A lot of apartments have those that kind of divide the kitchen and the living room. Mm -hmm. It's maybe four, four and a half feet, like a pony wall, a little tall wall with a um, countertop on it. Underneath, there's a great place for a false wall. What you do is you get some wood blocks, a couple sections of two by four, whatever, and you basically just maybe one nail on each end. So not a lot of damage. Put it at the on each 
on two sides of that wall, either the top or the bottom or the left and the right, kind of whatever fits your space the best and your configuration. You have to kind of play with it a little bit. And at any big box hardware store, they sell paneling with different designs. And of course, you have the old school like paneling from the 60s and 70s. It looks like a wood grain. Um, but they have everything from like beadboard to ones that look like brick and stone and all sorts of different textures. And they come in kind of pre-cut sizes that are about four by eight. A lot of times, because everything's pretty much built to standard in a lot of apartments, one of these panels stuck down on that small space gives you, depending on the thickness of the boards that you framed it out with, that much extra space to store stuff. Hmm. So you can just and just tack the paneling on with with a couple nails where you can pop it off easily. Put a little finger hole on one side or if you're really handy with things, make a little hinge, you know, stick a a little bookshelf in front of each corner of it or give it a really, really simple framing finish just where it doesn't look like, oh, wow, there's a piece of paneling stuck here. Make an accent wall or something. That's why I like the ones that are kind of like the brick or stone Mm -hmm. textures. But the false wall, it's, you know, an afternoon project. It's really easy and, again, frees up a lot of storage that doesn't look like anything. It just looks like it's something that's built in that people can walk by and they have no idea what's underneath it. And it's really only limited by how much, you know, wall space you're willing to lose when it kind of pops out. Mm -hmm. So that's why I like it at the end of a hallway or under a bar, because those aren't really places that you're using a lot anyhow. And that's something that like I've personally done in the, like behind closets like in the far back wall of like longer walk-in closets, putting a false wall in there is super easy. And um, in a space like a closet or the end of a hallway, you don't really have to worry about the sides being exposed so much. So mm-hmm. it looks even more hidden. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So it's, it's really easy, really cheap. Paneling runs from anywhere 10 bucks a sheet to like the really fancy ones can be you know, a couple hundred dollars a sheet. But I mean, they have everything for every taste and every decor. Um so yeah, just get creative and have fun with it. There, there is space there if you just kind of look at it a little bit differently. And those are just some of my little favorite tips and tricks that have have worked out pretty well. Those are pretty awesome, Alana. Thank you. You're welcome. So now you've also been spending a lot of time in an RV recently and doing not really the tiny house thing, but kind of the tiny house thing. How has that challenged you as a professional organizer? in in your own life trying to prep in an rv oh well yeah it's it's definitely a challenge because you not only have space to consider but in a camper you also have to really think about weight Mm. like you can't put you know 500 pounds of water in there because then you can't pull the thing and just a little backstory i have a v6 pickup truck and a 16 foot fiberglass shell camper. So very, very light, very small. And this camper is already jam packed. It's got a bathroom, closet, kitchen, bed, dinette, everything packed into 16 feet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it is already, even with nothing in it, it's pretty tight, but I I do like to kind of have it ready to roll, Mm -hmm. so to speak, and stocked with whatever I might need. If I, for example, if I don't have time to grab stuff and put it in. Mm-hmm. So in that case, I'm not stacking up, you know, cans of soup and heavy stuff like that. I've It's pretty much primarily freeze dried mm-hmm. and in those big like metal cans because it, they're super light. You get a ton of, of food out of them. You just add water or whatever. And then bonus, you have like an awesome metal can when it's empty that you can use for other things. So you want to look at a lot of double duty Mm -hmm. stuff as well. Which ones did you end up finding that were in metal cans? I've only seen the, uh, like the plastic, the big plastic wise bins and things like that. Well, it's not really a a prepping food brand, I guess, but there's one called thrive Mm -hmm. and all their stuff comes in metal. Like the small, they have small cans and then like the big number 10 size cans. Those are Mm -hmm. all metal. Oh, okay. Is it so with their stuff, 
are they packing it? It's not individual meals then? Is it? Is it just like here's a giant tub of green beans or something or peas? Most or? of it is like that, yeah. The stuff in cans is like single ingredient stuff. Yeah, I think I looked at them a long time ago. They do have meals now, but they're in pouches just like any other kind of camping food or that mm-hmm. express food, like the Mountain House and all that. It's in the, the Mylar pouches where you just add the water. And all those other brands too are great for something like that in an RV or something that you – do have to consider weight just those pouches are great because they're super light you tend to get several servings in those versus you know kind of to compare it to a can of soup or stew or something you know they say two servings on the can but let's get real who's gonna like eat half a can of thing You're like oh i'm full i gotta <laughs> save the rest of this for later that's really one serving yeah yeah so what <laughs> how did your priority shift as far as what did you kind of have to give up in in the rv or give up having less of besides just like cans of soup and things like what else did you have to give up um well with the camper i you know cases and cases of ammo and stuff like that is definitely (laughs) not an option yeah can't be a rolling armory yeah (laughs) (laughs) so that's not that's not gonna happen having like five different you know rounds and you know, thousands of rounds of each, you really have to to whittle it down to what's the most useful thing. Um, and just in my RV, or it's not really an RV, it's a camper, I just kind of throw words around. <laughs> but for that, where I am when I'm in that thing, I'm usually, you know, national parks and rural areas. I'm not going to like RV parks and things like that with a lot of people. So what I choose to keep in that is just a really basic little 22 Mm. because if, you know, it's maybe not so great for defense, but I still wouldn't want to get shot with one, but still, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, But it's more focused on like, if I did have to, you know, scare away an animal or hunt something, it's just a nice little tool to have in there. Mm -hmm. And of course the rounds are small and light and you get a whole lot of them in a small space. So did you end up focusing, so is that all you ended up doing was just the the 22 or did you end up just saying, hey, I'm just going to focus on these one or two different calibers and just really whittle things down? That's pretty much what I did for for just the, the camper. I still have, you know, oodles of redundancy everywhere else, but in the camper, right. I, I definitely whittled it down. I, I keep a 22 in there all the time um, with you know, a few hundred rounds of ammo and it's not too heavy. And then of course, just my everyday carry, I do have, you know, a handgun on me. It, the caliber may vary just depending what I'm wearing that day. Right. But um, I, yeah, I always, always have some other backup handgun, but that the little 22 like lives in the camper. Mm-hmm. How did water end up becoming affected by the, uh, living out of the camper for a bit? Well, it's not too bad. It, it the camper I chose does have a pretty nice size water storage tank on it. Mm-hmm. It can hold, I think, 15 gallons. Okay. And um, so that, that's pretty good there. So I don't, when I'm in the camper, I have, you know, a few gallons of just regular drinking water. But I do have 15 gallons of clean water that I can tote around with me at any given time. So it's it's pretty decent there. And, of course, I have filters and things like that. So yeah. Where I'm at, I can do a little water search if I need to. So that's interesting. How how long did you find that the 15 gallons actually lasts you? You know, I have run off of it exclusively for four or five days. Oh, okay. And I and I never ran out. And I used it for drinking, cooking, really quick showers, things like that. And um, I still had it when I left. So I didn't measure the amount. Mm-hmm that was still in there whenever I, you know, parked it and drained it, but you know, it wasn't dripping dry whenever I, whenever I left. So it actually lasted me a while. If you can serve it and you know, don't take hour long spa showers in your, in your (laughs) RV, you'll probably be okay for a little while. Of course, if it's just me, that's one thing, but if you have a family of four in there, you Mm -hmm. you might have to skip the showers. (laughs) Yeah. Or do sponge baths of some kind or something. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So moving on to, so actually to, to back up for just a second before we leave the RVs, and I know we we talked about this a little bit before we started recording as far as insurance, how 
and this is super random. I'm just throwing in. It made me think of it. How does insurance end up? How do you end up insuring an RV? Do you just, I mean, is it like car insurance or what is, how does that work? Sort of. Well, it can depend on the state. And of course you want to check with the, the requirements in your state, but in Texas, if the camper is under, I think 5,000 pounds, then it just automatically becomes covered under your car insurance. Oh, okay. Most of the time. And mine is, is very light. So I did not have to get additional insurance for it. Like I can, I can, if I wanted to, but as far as legal and liability and all that, mm. because it's under that weight limit, it's, it is covered by my vehicle insurance. Oh, okay. So if it's a heavier camper or RV, well, especially if it's an RV that drives, it has the, the vehicle mm-hmm. and the camper together. You, you treat that like a car. There is, there is insurance. Right. Specific yeah. For that. It's a whole vehicle but, at that point. Yeah. Yeah. But a heavier, heavier camper, you might need to get additional insurance. Like one of those great big airstreams or something like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which I mean, if you had one of those things, those things are so expensive. You really would want to get insurance, uh, extra oh insurance God, on it. Regardless whether it was required or not, you want to. Yeah. They're, they're insane. Save. So, and that was another thing you brought up earlier, as far as insurance goes that I guess to, to back way up and be out of order here, the, uh, you had mentioned, uh, renter's insurance often doesn't cover uh, flood flooding. Can, can you talk about that for a second? Cause that was something I didn't know about. Yeah. That's something that a lot of apartment dwellers kind of overlook. Um, and I know so many that don't even have renter's insurance. Like it's not expensive. People get renter's insurance just to protect you. Cause you don't know what the freak next door is like burning in the middle of the night or whatever that could maybe <laughs> catch the whole place on fire. Mm-hmm. That's, that's the one thing I don't like about apartments is you don't really know what's around you. And you have no control over that. Yeah. So even if you're not, you know, an idiot and doing stupid things, that's going to, you know, destroy the place you live. You don't know what the person on the other side of the wall is up to. Yeah. So get renter's insurance. And also with that, renter's insurance does not cover flooding. It'll cover flooding from a burst pipe or something like that. But, you know, in a hurricane or, you know, all these floods that we've been seeing over the summer, renter's insurance does not cover that, does not cover natural flooding you would have to get flood insurance just like any standard, you know, home policy. It is a separate thing that you may or may not be required to, depending on well, if you live in a flood zone or not. But um, yeah, that's something a lot of people overlook. And then, especially if you live on the bottom floor of an apartment, it's it's a good thing to have. Huh, great. Yeah, that's that's a great tip. The and I just yeah, I realized like, whoa. Gosh, what was it? Twenty years ago, or a little more than twenty years ago? I'm not going to go into how many years ago exactly. Uh, when I lived in a garage apartment, I think that was a, a huge oversight for me. Luckily, nothing ever serious ever happened. But yeah, I could definitely see, and especially if you're on a ground level in an area. I mean, flooding can happen almost anywhere, but especially yeah. in areas like where you and I are, where flooding is pretty much a given. Uh, oh, yeah. On an annual basis, so that's not a bad idea. Bayou City, hello. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So now you were also telling me a, a cool story about sort of a a niche in your professional organizing and prepping business that you have that you've kind of fallen into, and I just thought it was neat to hear about, and maybe it'll help some people in the audience think about. Oh yeah, maybe I should uh, help help mom figure some of those things out. Can, can you kind of tell us about about this this clientele that you've been catering to a lot lately? Oh yeah, there apparently is a lot of need for senior, elderly. I hate to call them elderly; they'd slap me if I said that. But um, <laughs> women, like single older women, like mm-hmm. widowers, um, divorcees, that maybe lived their whole life not thinking about prepping or preparedness and then suddenly find themselves alone. Mm. Kids moved away, husband has passed away, and th- they feel kind of lost and ill-prepared and kind of nervous about things, especially, you know, they're watching the news and seeing all this stuff going on. They're, some of them are getting a little scared. So I have kind of become involved with a, I guess, a small community of of women in this situation that have kind of banded together and are trying to learn. It's just been a really interesting process for all of us. Like they're, they're coming into this kind of blind and 
it started out with just like, oh, I need to get some extra food if something happens. You know, my, my kids are telling me to get food and water and I don't know what to do. And then I'm, I'm coming in to help them. And then during the process, I'm also trying to educate them about all those other things that are just as important as food and water, like your hygiene, um, first aid, have, you know, have some basic first aid on hand, extra medication. Most of these women are on several different medications mm. and they just kind of get it month to month. And it's hard to stock up and things like that because a lot of you know their insurance plans or, or whatever only let them get maybe one month of, of prescriptions at a time, which really kind of throws a wrench into having those backups. So that might be something that, that people want to look into with their, their current situation. Also, um, you know, it, it makes me think of, you know, my parents and things like that. So it's something that people can look at. So is it usually something that these women are thinking of it on their own and they come to you for that reason? Or is it something where maybe uh, one of their children says, hey, you know, mom, you're 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 a little older, you're you're alone now. Maybe you should think about having some food and some other ways of protecting yourself or something on hand. How, how are those conversations happening or is it just a mixed bag? Yeah, it's a little of everything. Um, the first one that came to me was really just interested in in food because one of her children was like, yeah, you know, mom, you probably ought to have a little extra food on hand for whatever. They were probably having a conversation about politics or something and it just kind of went to that. And so mm. she asked me to come in and kind of help her create just like a little storage system for, you know, just like a, have a couple weeks worth to get started and go from there. And then just in her talking to her, her friends and, and other women in her situation, I was contacted just with a myriad of, of different questions and um, situations. And it's all just very, it's, it's, it's really varied. <laughs> <laughs> so, and some have a lot and, you know, and these, these women are, you know, they've been around for decades and collecting and, and, I don't want to say hoarding, but you accumulate things when Junk. you're in a house for a long time. Yeah. You accumulate stuff. And so I'm going in and kind of helping them, for one, realize that they already have most of what they need. They just don't know how to utilize it. Oh, that's interesting. So talk about that for a second. So, yeah, um, there's one woman in particular that I'm helping her go through her um, late husband's estate because she just didn't have the time and kind of the emotional power to just sit down and go through all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm coming in doing it for, her and we're not only finding, you know, keepsakes and photos and all that normal kind of stuff. We're finding all sorts of kind of like camping gear because he, he was a hunter and all this stuff was just kind of thrown in the back of a garage and things like that. I mean, there are knives and lanterns and stoves and, very sadly, like rusted guns. And, oh no! And things like that. And um, she's got cats, lots of cat litter. And I was like, you know what? Save some of this cat litter for yourself. It's really useful <laughs> in certain situations. <laughs> it's just a little things like that. Um, we're just kind of sorting through and grouping because she's over here, like, oh, I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm so unprepared and this and that. And after going through some of her late husband's stuff, it's like, well, you know, you've got cooking options. You've got light options that's just now focus on food and water and just by doing some of some of that kind of inventory to see what you already have it took a lot of stress off of her like she already was like felt instantly better she's like oh he's still taking care of me and like it got really emotional oh that's yeah cute. it was really sweet hmm. but she felt a lot better when we kind of got that kick started and plus she got a lot of her her space back too because we were clearing out boxes of tax receipts from 30 years ago. It's like, you really don't need to save this stuff. You know, you can get rid of all this stuff and store your newfound like gear kit back here instead. Mm -hmm. you know? so, so that's going pretty well. Yeah. I'm kind of watching my mom go through that with, uh, with my parents stuff. Although of course she, she teases that as fast as she gets rid of it, he keeps accumulating more of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's different, different story altogether. So that's pretty neat. Do any of them get into concerns about their personal security and safety? And do you end up consulting with them on any of that? 
A little bit. It's a pretty, they're a pretty tight knit community and they kind of watch each other's back and things like that, which is important. That's always good to have. Mm-hmm. But um, a lot of these women, you know, that don't lock their doors and things like that. So a lot of it is just kind of a basic, almost a reality check. Like, no, you really have to lock your doors. I know you've never locked them before and nothing's happened, but every day's new day. Something could happen. Yeah. Yeah. So just really basic stuff and um, helping them get, you know, their um, information in order and things like that. So if something did happen, someone did break in, they have a little hiding space with, you know, cash and paperwork and things like that, that may not be targeted, Mm -hmm. I guess you could say. Security is an issue, but mostly it's getting them to realize that it is an issue. Yeah. Yeah, I would imagine that's that would be an issue to overcome. I mean, it's there. I run into a lot of instances like that, uh, w- working with, uh, with older clients and stuff like that, or even just working with my parents and trying to say, you know, you really ought to think about this. And it's like, well, you know, that's not, you know, it's like, well, you're basing that on 30 year old, 40 year old information. Maybe it's time to kind of update our thinking a little bit. Yeah. And, and trying not to do that as uh, coming across as being a condescending ass, which is, is always a difficult for me period. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. But anyway, well, awesome, a lot of So, of course, you have a website and everything. And if people want to get in touch with you and get help with their personal organization needs or maybe help their parents or something like that, how do people connect with you? How do people get in touch with you? Well, I do have a website with my contact information. It's prepperfection.com. And I'm on Facebook as well, facebook.com slash Prep perfection. So it's pretty easy to get a hold of me. Awesome. Alana, as always, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you so much. It was so much fun to be back. Show notes, links to Alana, and links to resources mentioned in this episode can be found at in the slash E 197. Support the show and get special members only benefits. Visit itrh.net. In the Rabbit Hole is supported almost exclusively by members just like you. And they get some cool stuff in return. Again, go to itrh.net to find out more and become a member today. A quick announcement before we close out today. The show will be back to its normal weekly schedule now. The wedding stuff and producing classes for people interested in starting their own podcasts has taken a little more time lately than expected. With the wedding stuff behind me and the podcasting program underway, things should get back to normal around here. With that, we wrap up episode number 197 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe and sound.